know, not as a doctor, but as a as a human. I don't know if you're a family man or not, but uh, sure. you know, how do you see the present state of the world, environmentally, you know, socially, politically? Well, I can give you my unique uh, perspective, and that is, uh, we've spent ten thousand years building a system that is fundamentally flawed. Uh, that is from the standpoint of the food supply. So 10,000 years ago, humans were distracted by the seeds of grasses. That's what grains are. So humans for 2.5 million years have been omnivorous. We ate the organs and flesh of animals and sea creatures and freshwater creatures and mushrooms and edible parts of plants, nuts, seeds, berries, all the things that Homo sapiens instinctively regards as food. But in a moment of desperation, and this happened oddly, roughly simultaneously, roughly speaking in archeolo archeological terms, I mean no more than a few thousand years apart, uh, humans turned to the seeds of grass. The seed of grass in the Fertile Crescent was einkorn wheat in Mesoamerica, now Mexico. It was teosinte and maize. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it was millet and sorghum. In the swamps of Southeast Asia and India, it was rice. We turned to the seeds of grasses and we found that we could consume them. We can't consume the roots, we can't consume the stalk, the leaves, the husk. We learned, we're clever beasts, aren't we? We learned we could separate the seed, remove the husk, pulverize it and heat it, and we could make food out of the seeds of grasses. Something we'd never done in the preceding 2.5 million years of our existence, but we found out 10,000 years ago, more or less, that we could consume the seeds of grasses. So it allowed us to survive. It allowed us to survive during moments of desperation, and we survived another day, another week, another month, and we didn't appreciate that we would pay a health price. So uh, any anthropologist would tell you that uh, uh, when humans first turned to the seeds of grasses for calories, there was a dramatic transformation in human health. Uh, before then, tooth decay was rare. And we're talking about populations of humans that had no toothpaste, no toothbrushes, no dentist, no orthodontist, no fluoridated water, no dental floss. And very little tooth decay, depending on what population, what time of the world, part of the world, roughly 0.4% of teeth recovered showed evidence of decay or gingivitis and infection, etc. At that moment in time when we consumed the seeds of grasses, tooth decay exploded. Varied in different parts of the world, but 60 to 16 to 50% of all teeth showed decay or were missing or rotten. Many times we showed shrinkage of the maxillary bone shrinkage of the mandible, and evidence for iron deficiency called parotid hyperstosis showed up in the fossil record. And, at least initially, there was a drop in height. So when humans first turned to the seeds of grasses, we paid a very significant health price. And we see that, by the way, repeated when we have hunter-gatherer cultures that have persisted living Stone Age lives into the 19th, 20th, 21st century, and they're exposed to modern food, that is, the seeds of grasses and other things like sugars, the same scenario plays out. Explosive tooth decay, psychiatric disease, arthritis, depression, hypertension, obesity, diabetes. And those cultures, by the way, get it worse than we do because they've lived the last 2.5 million years without the benefit of having accommodated partially genetically to the seeds of grasses and agriculture. So we arrive at this place now in 2013 where 50%, 50% half of all human calories now come from the seeds of grasses, wheat, corn, and rice. Well, that's a very destructive way to live. It allows you to survive, but it means you're going to be afflicted with a whole range of chronic illnesses. It causes the pharmaceutical industry to thrive. It causes an extraordinary need for health care. But it's because we've become reliant on the seeds of grasses, as if we're ruminants, and we're not, of course, we're homo sapiens. So uh, that worries me a lot, because it means that the explosive population growth permitted by cheap, easy calories allowed the world to expand to seven billion people on a planet that probably shouldn't be allowed to expand to seven billion people. And it happened because we had the seeds of grasses that allowed us to survive a short period of time, but not a long period of time without developing health problems.
So what's the difference between a, a seed of a grass and the seed of another plant that we would uh, benefit from eating? The seeds of grasses have all sorts, and I mean that literally. So if you cut your lawn, your backyard, we don't save those clippings, right? We can't eat that. So there are specific adaptations required to consume grasses and the seeds of grasses. So, so for instance, a ruminant, a cow, or its ancient counterpart, aurochs, or a goat, or its ancient counterpart, uh, ibex. Uh, uh, creatures that graze on grasses, they're, they're adapted to that. But they're adapted because they have teeth that grow continuously. Grasses have something called phytoliths in their blades, and they abrade teeth. And if we tried to eat it, we would erode our teeth in just a few years. So ruminants have teeth that continuously grow throughout their entire lives, compared to our twice. Uh, they also have four compartment stomachs. One of the uh, compartments has an erosive grinding capacity to break those grasses down. They bring it back up as a cud to chew again. Their stomachs have uh, unique microorganisms that break down the grasses. We have a boring straight shot colon with a couple of turns. They have spiral colons that also have unique microorganisms that further break down the cellulose in, in grasses. In other words, they have extensive evolutionarily acquired adaptations to allow them to consume grasses, none of which we have. So grasses were never meant for human consumption. The seeds have an entire array of components that are not suited for human. There are good things too. There's some vitamins, there's some calories, at least from starch. There's some protein, there's some, some other good things, fiber perhaps, uh, but there's all kinds of nasty things in there too. And so when we rely on those things, we're exposed to all the adverse components of the seeds of grasses. Well, it's interesting because bread seems to be the staple, the one staple throughout every culture, almost every culture. I don't know about Native American, oh, you were saying that, 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 that uh, Mesoamerican culture had, had grains as well. If we look at, at Native uh, American and Canadian cultures uh, in the Northwest Pacific, along the Southeast Coast, Mesoamerica, South America, when they turn to, in this case, teosint and maize, you really can't eat teosint. Uh, teosint looks like a grass. There's no big juicy cob. Maize uh, is really a mutation. And so now, of course, modern corn is ex an extreme mutation. That's just the seed, the seed head and seeds that have been mutated by a variety of means for its starch content. And it has become uh, the world's preeminent source of cheap calories. So corn was the, was the seed of a grass that Native Americans, Native uh, Canadians turned to. And the very same scenario played out. An explosive increase, <clears throat> pardon me, an explosive increase in tooth decay, tooth loss, changes in facial structure, crooked teeth, iron deficiency, uh, pellagra, uh, uh, lack of B vitamins. So we pay a health price every time we turn to the seeds of grasses. So this, this same scenario plays out in every stage. The one, where, the one place where it doesn't play out all that significantly is, is Asia. Rice being the most benign of the seeds of grasses because it's mostly a starch, not so much a protein. A lot of the adverse effects of the seeds of grasses come by way of the proteins, uh, less, less through the starches. So it's not really it has anything to, much to do with genetically modified grasses, although that's a, that's a subject all on its own, it sounds like. But it, it, I also wanted to ask you about the four food groups because we have, we've been all been trained, in North America I think, I don't know about Europe, into four food groups, right? One is the grains, cereals, uh, dairy, and of course the others. But from what I understand, uh, that was invented by the dairy industry, that really we don't need dairy and we don't need grains by the sounds of what you're saying. Exactly right. There is no fundamental physiologic human need for anything in grains nor in dairy. In, in fact, they're relatively recent. Dairy being added about the same time as the seeds of grasses because the domestication of creatures like aurochs into cows occurred roughly the same time. In fact, the two may be intertwined. That is, domestication of animals that ate the grasses may have prompted humans to ask, can, can we eat that too? So the two are, are tied closely together. If you and I, were evil business people 
and we wanted to profit in a large and substantial way from the diet of the world. Well, you could make money in petroleum, right? In, or you could make it in iron ore. You want to tr participate in, on a large scale in the financial dealings of the world. You turn to, commoditize, to commodities, things that are uh, transportable over a long distance, have extended shelf life, are in wide demand, and more or less uh, um, uh, not subject to great variation in quality. So that's true of coffee, it's true for petroleum, uh, it's true for iron ore. What food can we turn into a commodity? Well, you can't do that with tomatoes. They last maybe three days, right? And not in necessarily worldwide demand. How about um, uh, pasture-fed, how about eggs from pasture-fed chickens? Tough to participate in a large worldwide scale. How about the seeds of grasses? Transportable by uh, ocean tanker over long distances. Shelf lies not measured in days or months, but in years. Uh, corn, rice, wheat can last years without refrigeration. It allows complex financial manipulations like selling futures and hedges and derivatives to maximize profit and to minimize risk. So if you want to participate in the world diet, you persuade the world that not only should they eat the seeds of grass, but their diet should be dominated by the seeds of grasses. So 50% of all human calories now come from wheat, corn, and rice. And we have the USDA and Health Canada and other government agencies telling us, well, that's getting better. It should be higher. It should be 60 to 70%. All we need to do is look at what's happening to the human uh, uh, profile of health worldwide. We know that obesity is the worst ever in the history of mankind on Earth. Diabetes, the worst epidemic ever witnessed in the history of Earth. Autoimmune diseases, exploding. Psychiatric illness, out of control. Arthritis, degenerative joint disease. Alzheimer's, explosively getting worse. A lot of these things are ironically blamed on us. We're told, for instance, that the obesity and diabetes epidemics are because we are gluttonous and lazy. I don't buy it. In fact, physical activity in a lot of uh, segments of society has increased, yet they're all struggling with the same problems, diabetes, obesity, and other health problems. So we've got to look elsewhere, I think. I don't think we can be blamed as responsible citizens for a lot of these problems. I look at the seeds of grasses. Now, humans have consumed the seeds of grasses for 10,000 years, but never before has it become so dominant and never before did agribusiness change the genetics of the plant that turns something not so good for the human diet into something that's far worse. And in their great arrogance, they introduce extreme and bizarre techniques and never test for human uh, uh, suitability. Now, we could call it genetic modification, but it doesn't have to be genetic modification. That's the smoke screen thrown up by agribusiness. They say, for instance, wheat has not been genetically modified. That's true. It has not. It's been changed by other means besides gene splicing and genetic engineering. But it doesn't mean those other techniques are benign or more benign. And in fact, so in some cases, the methods that predate modern genetic modification are worse than genetic modification, such as the methods of mutagenesis the purposeful induction of mutations using gamma rays, high dose x-ray, ultraviolet radiation, and toxic chemicals to induce mutations. And those crops already have been sold for years. One thing that, that um, I've read that you have mentioned is that they, might, they, they have modified wheat so that there are actually addictive qualities to, to the new strains. Is that, is, that, is that correct? I think many of the peculiar characteristics of modern wheat this seed of a grass called modern wheat were unintentional, at least not intended to, hurt, to hurt people or to extract some specific characteristic from people. They were, they were, these changes were introduced for the sake of agricultural needs, such as increased yield per acre or resistance to drought or um, resistance to something called lodging, which is a storm blows through your field and it can flatten your whole field. But if you have, for instance, short 
dwarf strains which, with very thick stalks because of mutation in the gibberellin gene. That's what that's called. Um, your, your, your crop is more likely to survive. So there's, it's not always for evil purpose. The, the fundamental problem in agribusiness is that you can change the genetics of a plant, whether it's corn or wheat or rice or any other crop, and there's no obligation to test it in animals nor in humans. And I'm talking about the methods that predate genetic modification, though this continues to be largely true in the age of genetic modification. So you can change something. Now, if you and I were evil scientists, not evil businessmen, this in this case, but evil scientists, and we want to create, say, a mutated orangutan who does our bidding. Maybe we want an orangutan to stand only two feet tall, be really good at climbing trees, and be hairless so he can go faster and throw down coconuts for us. So how do we create that mutation? Well, we're going to have to take the fetus in the mother's womb and expose the fetus to poisons given to the mother or to gamma rays directed at the fetus or x-ray or something. Now, we do that. Maybe the first thousand tries come out dead, mutated, all kinds of unanticipated, uncontrolled mutations. But maybe that thousand first time we get what we want and this orangutan does what we want it to do, climb trees really fast and throw coconuts. But it probably has a whole bunch of other mutations. Maybe it's got brain malformations, biochemical modifications. Maybe it's got only one arm or whatever. We can't control it. If we were agribusiness scientists, we would say, we don't really care about that because it did what we wanted it to do and that's all we care about. And that's what they do in agribusiness. You introduce mutations and changes, but don't look for them provided their crop still performs as expected. So how is wheat uh, addictive and how is it toxic to us? So the changes introduced into wheat over the last 40 years for good purpose, good intentions to increase yield, etc., inadvertently changed the structure of the gliadin proteins in wheat. And we know this for a fact. We know that the gliadin structures of 1960, for instance, are very different from the gliadin structures of 2013. For instance, there's one gene that's been mapped out. It's called GLIA, sorry, GLIA alpha 9, which was not that common in 1960 strains of wheat. It's very common in the strains of 2013. Well, this GLIA alpha 9 sequence, this genetic sequence, programs for a protein that is very, a very potent cause of celiac disease. That is the intestinal destruction um, that occurs with uh, consumption of wheat or gluten. Well, celiac disease has quadrupled in the last 50 years. It's, been, it's doubled in the last 20 years. And gastroenterologists are asking, what's different about humans? Well, I think a more logical question, because humans can't change that much in those few years. I think a more logical question, a more logical place to look is what's changed about the wheat. And we know, we know for a fact that the wheat has been changed and among the changes are changes in the gliadin protein. One of the, another change introduced in the gliadin is that uh, uh, now when we ingest gliadin in the form of say a bagel, uh, we break it down into small pieces, about five or six amino acids long, small peptides. And these peptides are known to cross into the brain and bind to the opiate receptors. Now, unlike other opiates like morphine and heroin and oxycontin that provide pain relief or provide a euphoria, these do not do that. They only cause addictive eating behavior and stimulate appetite. And they stimulate appetite specifically for carbohydrates. So if you have the gliadin-derived opiates of wheat, you're not prompted to consume more salmon or chicken fat you're prompted to consume more chips, cookies, cupcakes, and other carbohydrates. And this, by the way, coincides perfectly with the introduction of high-yield semi-dwarf wheat with its changed form of gliadin in the early 1980s to mid-1980s when calorie consumption of carbohydrates went up across North America by 400 calories per person per day. And that also coincides perfectly with the start of the obesity epidemic and the start of the diabetes epidemic. So wheat is the perfect obesogen. It is the perfect food to make you fat because it has its very own appetite stimulant built into it.
This is true for wheat and its close genetic relatives, rye and barley, and to some degree corn, because the zein protein of corn looks a lot like gliadin. So these are foods I would argue, I think, the food industry knows all about. Because this, this research is not secret. A lot of this research was performed at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, in the 70s. And we've known for 40 years that wheat contains an opiate. And rather than talking about it and warning us, I think smart food scientists caught on and said, let's put it in everything. Because I know of no way to justify the fact that in 1960, you and I could walk up and down the supermarket aisles and ask, what foods contain wheat? And we'd find in obvious places, bread, rolls, and pancake mix. 2013, and this has been true for over 30 years now, we ask, what foods in the grocery store contain wheat? What's in bread, rolls, and pancake mix? And candy bars, licorice, uh, all breakfast cereals, all frozen dinners, uh, salad dressing. In foods, you say, what in the world is wheat flour and some form doing in there? I, 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 have a, I have a hard time believing it's there for taste and texture only. I think smart food scientists figured this out and said, let's put it in everything. And that's one of the reasons why people say, when they first embark on this kind of wheat-free or, or grain-free notion, they say, it's impossible. Every, everything in the grocery store has wheat in some form, from soy sauce to Twizzlers. And they're right. But it's on purpose, I believe. You know, it's funny how, how people who investigate recognize that a, a fellow who's, who's high up with the Monsanto is now the head of the FB, FDA in the States, right? <laughs> but most people don't know that, yeah. right? I would, what do you think of the forces at work here? That the health of the individual, of, of, a, of the human being, is not the most important issue in, in this world. I mean, in every area. I don't think there's just one force at work here that's created this incredible situation of the human population now obtaining 50% of all its calories from the seeds of grasses. I don't think there's any one phenomenon to blame. I think there's a, a variety of converging factors. There's the fact that it's cheap and accessible. The fact that it's highly profitable because you can treat the, the diet of the, of the world now as a commodity. They have commoditized the human diet. I think that it allows top-down control over diet and thereby more stability. If we had starvation in the U.S. and Canada intermittently and unexpectedly, it would cause great unrest. And so the positive aspect of grains is that they are plentiful, cheap and available. Uh, so I think there are many factors at work here. Um, we also have the influence of agribusiness, very, very heavy-handed influence. They're among the biggest spenders in the U.S. for lobbying efforts. They spend incredible amounts of money lobbying Congress, Senate, USDA. The USDA is very heavily lobbied, lobbied as is the FDA. We have this so-called golden revolving door we have uh, attorneys and high-level executives in agribusiness getting nice jobs in regulatory agencies like the USDA and FDA and back and forth over and over again. Now there's a bit of wisdom in that in that these are experts therefore in a specific uh, niche of industry but there's also plenty of potential and very little regulation of the potential for not for, for biased work particularly when they're in their government role. So that, that's part of this also. It allows smooth sailing for agribusiness to get their legislation through. And we know that agribusiness vigorously opposes our desire to know better. So the Proposition 37 in California was overturned because they have very deep pockets. So Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, uh, Monsanto, all those companies put together a very significant war chest and by uh, um, flooding the airwaves with their, with their ads, they managed to persuade voters that it was not good to simply know that there is genetically modified food at the supermarket. I, I, just on the internet, I find that you know that you debunked, the, the, the wheat sure. belly debunked, I've seen all sure. this. Sure, sure. You're going to meet opposition, of course. How do you feel being a, a, a sort of a lone voice? Well, I, I don't think I'm a lone voice. That's what makes this much more fun and tolerable that uh, 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 many of my colleagues, I think I've managed to open their eyes. 
Uh, and it's not because my colleagues are necessarily all that open-minded. They're often not. You know, and, uh, much worse in the U.S., where, where health care is driven by revenue, where a hospital and now employed physicians work to increase revenues for their system. And so you got nice people with that nice health insurance. Uh, you tend to overuse the health care system for the sake of driving revenue. So we got a lot of that business going on. But I think what's sparked, what's ignited interest in my colleagues is seeing patients coming back and saying, the doc says, what happened to you, John? And John says, yeah, I know I lost 78 pounds. I had to stop my insulin and my two diabetes drugs. I stopped my drugs for arthritis and I'm no longer depressed. And that funny rash I had uh, on, my, on my chest is now gone and my hair is growing back. <laughs> uh, and the doc says, okay, some peculiar coincidence. Another patient comes back and says something similar. Another patient comes back. In other words, I think that's what's happening. My, my colleagues are witnessing the transformations in health that people are experiencing. And they're starting to have their eyes open and asking, well, gee, maybe there is something to eliminating this thing called wheat. So um, uh, there is also, by the way, a lot of science behind this. It's not like this is just built on pure anecdote. There is a lot of anecdote, a lot of stories, because I see these stories coming by flooding my social media every day. But that's what astounded me as I tried to understand these issues. There's a lot of science. For instance, the discovery of the gliadin-derived opiates in wheat was published in 1979. And that, by the way, that study was performed because the, the biochemists at the NIH wanted to know why several studies had documented improvement in paranoid schizophrenia in people who had wheat taken out of their diet in closed ward settings in hospitals. So there's a, there's a sequential logic to all this that uh, astounded me that this is, a lot of this is known, but it's not talked about. In fact, you know, it would have been forgivable, I think, if USDA and Health Canada had said, you know, reviewing all the data, we're not sure how safe it is to consume modern grains. So be careful. You can consume maybe some, but we're just going to have to think about how safe that is. They didn't say that, of course. They said, eat all you can. Eat as much as you can, in fact, um, and allow it to dominate diet. So they ignored the fact that this was a very different experience from the evolutionary story of adaptation of human, humans on Earth and they ignored that striking changes had been introduced by agribusiness. There's more sugars in wheat than there is in table sugar. Is that, is that something that is a, is a recent development in grains? There's the starch because in grains are called amylopectins and amylose, which are just polymers or chains of glucose, chains of sugar. So the, the great misunderstanding, deception would be too strong a word, but the great misunderstanding among the dietary community is that complex, I'm sure you've heard this, complex carbohydrates are better for you than simple carbohydrates. That is, long chain carbohydrates are better for you than simple sugars like sucrose or glucose. Well, there's a bit of truth. There's a germ of truth in that, in that the complex carbohydrates do tend to come with B vitamins and fiber, et cetera. But let's look at this from a blood sugar viewpoint. Blood sugar goes up higher after complex carbohydrates than after simple sugars. So I often remind people that blood sugar goes up higher after two slices of whole wheat bread than six teaspoons of table sugar. People don't think that. Now that high blood sugar is not benign. We've just had a recent study about just a few weeks ago that uh, uh, showed very conclusively that blood sugars just a little bit above the normal range, little bit, not, not diabetic range, not pre-diabetic range, just a little bit higher, lead to Alzheimer's disease. So uh, high-ish blood sugars are not benign. So if we consume a, a life of grains, a diet dominated by grains, because people have their breakfast cereal for breakfast, a wheat snack like crackers at 9 a.m., a lunch of low-fat turkey breast on two slices of whole wheat bread, another wheat snack, and then, and then maybe whole wheat pasta 
for dinner. Another snack made of wheat. High blood sugar occurs repetitively, and that really takes its toll for a variety of reasons. So this notion that complex carbohydrates are somehow better for you is deeply flawed because they're actually worse for you from a high blood sugar viewpoint. So you, is, I guess you feel that your mission is basically just to get the, the word out, to make people aware. And now how do you find that it, it's, it's being received? It's being embraced far more enthusiastically and uh, on a greater uh, widespread basis than I ever anticipated. When I came out with this message, I knew it worked. I'd done this thousands of times before. Uh, I, I saw people losing astounding quantities of weight, losing three, four, six inches off their waists, having relief from neurological impairment, from high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetics becoming non-diabetic, people with autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and uh, Crohn's disease, also having complete remission uh, or at least marked improvement. So I'd seen this play out many, many times, so I knew it worked. What I didn't expect was how widely it, would, it was embraced. And I think that's been uh, generated mostly by social media. The thing that really sparked my action, so I knew this worked. I talked about it, wrote about it, um, but I didn't have that kind of national uh, platform to, to, to talk uh, through. But I was seeing a patient in my office, and a 38-year-old school teacher uh, who had ulcerative colitis. She had 12 years of incapacitating cramps, diarrhea, and hemorrhage, intermittent hemorrhage, such that she required transfusions, blood transfusions, about every three months or so, on three drugs two very toxic drugs and a third one that was intravenous and very, very, very expensive. And when I was seeing her for a relatively minor heart complaint uh, that proved to be nothing, uh, she was always visibly wincing. Well, she told me one day that she, they had scheduled her for a colon removal, for colectomy, and a creation of an ileostomy bag. Well, she's a school teacher, and she teaches eight or nine, eight or nine year old boys. You can imagine their reaction uh, when this ileostomy bag makes noise. Uh, not to mention, she's a young woman now being disfigured by having this bag and, and having health problems that result from having her colon removed. She tells me this. I tell her what I do because I was seeing her for something unrelated. I hadn't talked about diet with her. So I asked her, you know, have you thought about wheat elimination? She gives me this confused look. What are you talking about? And I said, well, let me tell you what I think could happen. I told her what I've been seeing, that lives are being transformed by. She says, well, why would I do that? Uh, they tested me. They did the blood test for celiac disease. I don't have it. They even biopsied me twice through an endoscopy for celiac disease. I don't have it. I said, I understand that. I'm not talking about celiac disease. I'm talking about the destruction of health at the hands of modern wheat that has nothing to do with celiac disease. So she reluctantly does it. She comes back three months later. She's 38 pounds lighter. She told me that within five days, all the bleeding, cramps, and diarrhea stopped. A few weeks later, she stopped her first drug. A few weeks later, stopped her second drug. Stopped her third drug. She was cured. She felt better than she had in years. What really sparked my ac action, though, was she told her gastroenterologist that I am cured. I didn't go, have to go through my colon removal surgery or get the ileostomy bag. I'm off all three drugs. Look at me. I'm a different person. I feel better than I have in years. He says, must be a coincidence. Shrugged it off. And it was clear to me so it's not as if none of this research had been performed and we just needed more research. The research had been done. We do need some more, but there's a ton of it already. And I had read the research. I had talked to agricultural geneticists. I read the agricultural genetics literature to understand what was going on. And it was, it was incredibly clear that this was an incredible disaster created that was devastating to human health in also colitis and in many other ways. And so I just felt that it was time to talk about it on a wider stage. Cool. Thank you very much. Sure.